So hi everyone and welcome to our third annual Manchester Pride Conference. I hope you're enjoying the content so far. Thank you for joining our panel on creating inclusive culture today. I'm Fahana Hamani and I'm the Senior Engagement Manager at Manchester Pride. My pronouns are she and her and I head up our All Equals Charter Initiative which is designed to support businesses and organisations in creating inclusive cultures. I am so thrilled to be joined by two of our charter member organisations today, Auto Trader and Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Services. Um, and I'll let the panellists introduce themselves in just a moment um, but I'm just going to give you an overview of what we're going to be talking about today um, so we're going to be focusing on why creating an inclusive culture is so essential for businesses and organizations and how you can achieve this by talking about the experiences of these two great organizations um, we're also going to be focusing heavily on the importance of intersectionality and why EDI practices need to be thinking about what intersectional inclusion really looks like and how it can be in embedded within your organization. So I'm gonna hand over to our panelists to introduce themselves. If I can start with you, Jax, if that's okay. Yeah, um, hi everybody. Um, it's fantastic to be here. Um, so my name's Jax Effiong, my pronouns are she and her, and I'm the Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Manager for Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Service. Um, a little bit about me. Um, I, do you want me to do that now, sorry? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, sorry, sorry about that. Um, I joined the fire service 10 years ago as a community safety manager and as part of our prevention redesign, reducing fire risk for our most vulnerable communities across Greater Manchester. Once embedded in the organisation, I felt a need to increase visibility and support for our LGBTQ plus um, community and, and workforce and also our racially diverse staff. I'm very passionate about intersectionality, asserting our aspects of our identities and discrimination overlap. We all have different experiences and identities which interlock with each other. And considering these relationships when working to promote equity is crucial. So five years ago, I developed our LGBT and ally staff network, which is now our rainbow staff network chaired by amazing women. I also supported the development of our Black and Racially Diverse Staff Network and more recently our Disability and Women's Staff Network. I'm proud of the work I've achieved and more recently successfully becoming the EDI Manager for our service. I feel extremely privileged to be able to use this platform to contribute to the equality, diversity and inclusion ambitions within JMCA and our fire service family. Taking the workforce and communities with us as we strive for EDI excellence. I'm also hugely proud of becoming the Stonewall Northwest role model last year for my work within the service. And I feel our workforce are our most valuable asset. We strive to be a successful public service that reflects the people we serve and engages effectively with our workforce, having the right people with the right skills, creating a culture that is supportive, inclusive, and driven forward by inspiring role models and progressive leadership. So that's a little bit about me and my ambitions. Thank you. Thanks, Jax. Well, it's great to hear kind of the achievements of the Fire and Rescue Services. I'm excited to kind of talk a bit more about that. Um, Christos, it'd be great to introduce yourself. Uh, hello, everybody. It's great to be here. Uh, I'm Christos. Uh, my pronouns are he and him. And uh, I spend my working days uh, at Auto Trader, which is a Manchester headquartered business. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, together with my colleagues, uh, um, we work uh, in the people and culture team to create that culture that uh, uh, welcomes loads of diverse people and create that inclusive culture that uh, helps everyone work better together. Um, I've been there for seven years and I've been very fortunate uh, to be involved in loads of different initiatives uh, around our diversity and inclusion strategy. Uh, together with um, uh, many, many of our colleagues uh, that are very passionate um, about uh, really making a difference. Uh, and um, it's great that we are able to collaborate with a lot of charities like Manchester Pride and a lot of different other local charities uh, to actually make a difference, hopefully uh, a bit beyond uh, the uh, realms uh, of other trader. So yeah, thank you for being invited today. 
Well, thank you both for joining me today to kind of have this conversation. Um, in terms of getting started, I uh, really want to kind of focus on what are the key features of creating an inclusive culture and what does that look like for you? So can I start with you, Christos? What, what do you feel are the key features of that? Um, and how do you feel that Ultra Trader has kind of achieved that? Um, I think, first of all, it's important to look at the makeup of your employees uh, and make sure that uh, your employees are representative uh, of the communities that you operate in. So it's really important to make sure that there is representation is, uh, and looking at all the different different aspects uh, of, of diversity um, and making sure that you welcome people that are different uh, and then the second part of that is making sure that you create an environment where those people can work really well together. And I guess that's what we define as inclusion. The fact that you create that environment where everyone can uh, co uh, collaborate very closely uh, and everyone can be themselves. So people are able to, you know, ha have the opportunity to be you know, 100% himself at work. Uh, that makes them more happy and makes them more pr productive as well. Uh, and also, I think that makes them more collaborative with their colleagues. Uh, and I, I think it sounds quite simple if you put it like that. Uh, but in practice, uh, I think it takes a lot of effort. Uh, and I think culture, it's not something that um, you can create uh, and then you sort of like tick that box and that's it. Culture. Absolutely constantly evolves or culture is that you constantly something that you should have at the top of your priorities uh, and make sure that uh, you maintain uh, and evolve it uh, uh, always. Yeah, I think that's really interesting, especially the thing you kind of commented there around representation and the importance of representation within the organisation in terms of creating that culture. Jax, I kind of want to, to kind of get you to elaborate on that a bit. What are your thoughts around those key features in creating an inclusive culture? I think for me, what's really important is um, ensuring active allyship as part mm -hmm. of plans. Uh, I think that's really integral moving for forward. So our EDI strategy is underpinned by an action plan, which is meaningful and realistic, but it's also signed off by senior leads. So actually what you could do in is getting that really meaningful buying um, from our decision makers across the organization. Um, so for me, um, the action plan needs to be a live document so we can add important factors uh, that arise, for example, the impact on our workforce and communities with COVID inequalities and the impact of Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. uh, these are now part of our active action plan um, so that we move with the times and we keep current as well with the current climate is really, really important, but all, also communicating that across the organisation, but developing engaging products as well that benefit individuals uh, this really supports sign up um, and, and, and gets meaningful engagement across the organisation. But it's really important that those senior leads support our staff networks. Mm -hmm. And for me, those staff networks are at the heart of an inclusive culture in an organisation. They certainly are for fire service. Uh, and we have four um, established active staff networks. Uh, and we consult those networks. We ensure um, staff have time out to attend those networks and that we've got a, a confidential space as well uh, for people to talk about important matters for them. Um, so I think that's really important, but also training. Um, mm -hmm. If we really want to cascade an inclusive culture, um, we've really got to embed really good, useful training, whether that's e-learning, but follow that up with face-to-face -face training as well. And we try and do that, even though it's extremely challenging, when the, the majority of our staff uh, are on a 24 seven call out as an emergency service, we have to fit around them. We have to ensure that we're also accessible uh, to deliver that training across the workplace. And we did that with our trans and non-binary awareness training. And now let's talk about racism training that we just recently launched and um, where staff are asked to complete e-learning uh, and then take part in face-to-face -face meaningful discussion afterwards. Mm. 
So we have a range of products. We, we, we've designed a governance structure around EDI that's meaningful, um, that we report progression to senior leads on a regular basis, um, so that we do feel listened to um, and that we're heard and that there's actions that come out of the needs of individuals across the workforce. Um, and we've developed a really strong um, active allyship group. Uh, we call them our EDI spots, mm. EDI single points of contact, uh, contacts. And also we've got several working groups as well across EDI um, that I'll go into detail more um, as, as, as we discuss further. That's, that's really great. Thank you both. I, I guess one of the things you've both touched upon is that aspect of leadership and the need for that leadership buy-in from the beginning in terms of creating an inclusive culture. And Christos, you said that, you know, it's it's not, it sounds very simple in terms of when we say, you know, there are these certain markers to create that inclusive culture, but actually there's a lot of work that goes into that. And I wondered, Christos, if you could maybe talk a little bit about how Autotrader did that in terms of how did you get your leadership to have that buy-in for embedding this within the culture of the organization and how important representation in that leadership was as well? Mm, uh, yes, yeah, so um, I think the way we did it uh, is, first of all, start by defining what we mean by diversity and defining what we mean by inclusion mm. uh, and create that common understanding across everyone, starting from our senior leadership team and then uh, actually across, across the business. And this is something that we do with all the people that join us as well. So all our new starters will spend two days uh, uh, that is uh, exploring all different aspects of diversity and inclusion, uh, exploring how they can contribute to that. They meet all our networks or all our employee networks will spend uh, uh, time with them. Uh, and um, exploring other things like allyship and how they can be uh, allies. So I think it's very important to have a common understanding across the business of what do you mean by diversity and inclusion and the benefits of diversity and inclusion as well. Mm. So that will take you to a good grounding. Uh, and I think you need to then keep on building on that uh, throughout the year, not only with your senior leaders, but with every one across the organization and i think it's important not to have a top-down approach when it comes to diverse inclusion mm -hmm. because it's an excellent opportunity where everyone across the business can really contribute in a very meaningful way some of the best ideas that we had were from all different levels of the organization if you look at the example of our employee networks which are really at the at the heart of what we do when it comes to EDI and um, they started with one or two people that had their personal interest uh, whether they themselves represent certain communities or whether they're allies and that's actually a, a really big um, advantage is the fact that our employee networks are usually combine a member representing the community and an ally uh, as their lead uh, which brings those different perspectives uh, and, and I think it also shows the importance of allies by uh, allies dedicating time to actually lead the network uh, and show their support to that part of, them, of the community. So our networks really, all of them began from one or two people having a keen interest to make a difference uh, and then all of them have uh, an executive sponsor that supports them and supports them in a very meaningful way. So the support uh, supports that network by really sponsoring them, but not necessarily just showing up at an event, but they are there doing a lot of the work with the network and helping the network decide on their commitments. What are they going to try to achieve? What do they stand for? And then really supporting them with all their experience uh, uh, in order to achieve those commitments throughout the year. So I think it's really important to have clear, common understanding of what you're trying to achieve and then collaborate across all different levels of organiza the organization to try and achieve that and constantly, constantly look for different ways to get feedback and then do better 
and better and do more. Uh, I think that constant evolution of your EDI strategy uh, is something that uh, you need to have very, again, uh, very clear from the beginning. This is not a project that has started and an end it's part of your culture. Thanks, Kristen. And Jax, could I ask you the same question around your leadership at the Fire and Rescue Service and how that, how you kind of embedded that across the organisation? Because you talked a bit about the allyship work that you're doing and also kind of around the impacts within the organisation through training. Did you find, do you find that that's a barrier sometimes or a part of the journey in terms of getting leadership to think about this as a big part of the whole cultural identity of your organisation? I think it's really important to accept it's a journey and it's about evolving um, as organically as you possibly can. Because mm -hmm. for me, it's about winning hearts and minds. So for employers, it's about the commitment to be an inclusive culture, first and foremost. Have we got that commitment? Um, so understanding and listening to the workforce and we need senior leaders to do that. So mm -hmm. there needs to be a space for that and ensuring that they promote and make space for staff to come together, as I said before, because senior leaders are our decision makers. So identifying allies at the top level is vital for an inclusive change. Um, it also builds a network uh, of allies at a senior level um, to cascade across the organization. But like Christos just said, you know, it's not a top-down approach. We need to make our networks the heart of, of evolution you feel like so actually we're really um, doing meaningful, active listening and um, building on a network of allies around the ambitions to do with your EDI strategy or action plan or other key strategies. Because what I'm really conscious of is we don't want EDI to sit alone mm -hmm. um, because it's like, oh, it's, it's their job over there, for mm -hmm. example. So that's why we only have a very small team looking at EDI because it's the ambition that uh, EDI is everybody's business and everybody's responsibility across the organisation to embed it in their action plans going forward, to embed it in their strategies across the whole organisation. Um, and I think for me, um, when I started my conscious journey five years ago in the organisation, for me, it's, it was about self-care for the people moving the organisation forward um, and making sure we're taking the organisation with us so really doing that kind of feedback activity, uh, doing uh, satisfaction surveys, listening to staff across the organisation. Um, because you will get the same people attending um, EDI events, workshops, uh, lunch and learns, and sometimes it's the same faces. So the challenge is actually how do we engage um, the unengageable, if you like, across the organisation. But for me, it's about starting small, but dreaming big. Ensure you're involved in the organisation. Um, um, so sometimes we have to slow down. You know, I was very, very ambitious. What did everything changed at once? Um, but, but that was my life journey. You know, I started off as a youth and community worker. Um, so reaching out to a range of communities and also um, being a woman of colour, having um, being a lesbian, having that intersectional lifestyle um, was, is embedded in my makeup. Mm -hmm. um, but actually reaching out to the whole organisation, um, you need to listen and you need to ensure that people understand the journey that you're on. So you need to learn to slow down a little, but mm -hmm. also it's understanding how bureaucracy works. This can be excessively complicated. Um, so and it can be where the barriers are within an organisation. So we need to build strong business cases uh, and make sure they're embedded improvements, action plans, policies and training um, and ensuring that it is approved by senior leads so you can confidently cascade across the organisation your intention to improve EDI. Um, and that external influence plays a major part in supporting decision makers develop improvements. So as well as emphasising our legislative duty under the Equality Act, being scrutinised by national bodies like we are with our HMI CFRS inspection. Also, we take part in the Stonewall uh, Workplace Equality Index and obviously the local measures with Manchester Pride All Equals Charter. 
and our workplace race equality standards framework, it all assesses our progress so we can measure success and learn lessons for the future. It's very, very important that we're transparent and actually we, we take responsibility that we've got a long way to go as an organisation and that we hold people to account across the organisation because it is everybody's responsibility. Um, and I also I'll, I'll always say, don't let perfect get in the way you're good, but be brave as well. So um, sometimes you want to be perfect, but we don't know everything. We come with our own lived experience, our own expertise and knowledge, but we have to listen and keep that open mind to bring everybody with us. But we definitely need that organisational commitment to be an inclusive culture. Um, they need to understand and listen to underrepresented individuals and groups within our workforce. Um, so yeah, that, that's a big one for me, is listening, but also active listening across the organisation. I love that message about it's a journey. I think sometimes and being able to say we're doing well, but we know we're not there yet. I think there's a lot of fear that sometimes exists with organisations worrying about, you know, what if we get it wrong, which stops people from actually being able to try to do this work. And I think that's one, one thing that I found as well with the kind of through the charter is that barrier of people having fear of getting it wrong, which then in, in, you know, in turn stops them from actually giving this a go. And I love that message of that. It is a journey. It's a journey from right from the beginning and you are going to make mistakes, but it's about how you learn from those mistakes and how you improve from there. And I feel like you've both really touched upon that in terms of how this started you know Krista she talked about how it was one or two people who were passionate about it in the organization that then set that alight and same for you Jax in terms of your journey starting out dreaming big but knowing you need to take small steps to get there and um, what I'd really like to kind of talk about in terms of you've both touched on the importance of networks within your organizations and I assume both that includes LGBTQ plus networks but also other protected characteristics um, what about that kind of intersectional identities and how can we support employees with intersectional identities to you know, feel like they're being accepted with by their whole selves? And how do we create an environment where open and honest conversation can take place? I think that that's a really, I mean, that's a very large question to kind of dissect, but um, I'm really interested in, you know, networks are fantastic because it gives spaces for marginalized communities and our employees to talk about those key issues and make changes. But what, what do you feel about how you, look at staff that have intersectional identities and how do we kind of bring that into the conversation? How do we open those doors? Could I start with Christos? Could I ask you to kind of elaborate on that a bit? Sure. Um, I think, first of all, we need to demystify what we mean by intersectional identities. Um, I think it's a term that obviously has a, an, you know, an academic origin uh, and then through the years has developed to you know, various meanings that people use it. But I think when you're looking at an organization, I think it would be very good to just clarify what you mean and actually make everyone realize that in a way, we all have aspects of intersectional identities because we have different characteristics that make up who we are. So I think if you simplify it, then people relate to it more. So they appreciate that it's actually something that impacts themselves and all their colleagues. Now, that's not to downplay the fact that certain intersections and certain characteristics are disproportionately impacted, uh, you know, general in society, and that transcends into the workplace uh, and creates certain disadvantages. Uh, I wouldn't want to to imply that, and we need to be very conscious of that uh, and put our effort in order to counter off. Uh, uh, what actually um, that impact is uh, and that disadvantage. So I think that would be a good start. Uh, I think the thing where the networks come in uh, and where we've tried to do it, we've got a lot of different networks. So we've got our networks that are focusing on different uh, diversity characteristics. We've got the LGBT plus network, our women's network, our age network, uh, our disability and neurodiversity network, and our Bay Network, which is about building a multicultural environment. Uh, so all these networks, first of all, work a lot closer to each other. 
and but they also work with our other networks that we have, our family network, uh, our well-being network, our uh, career kickstart kickstart network, which is more about our, our people that are at the beginning of their career with other trader. So what we try to do in order to address uh, the fact that there's so much opportunity for collaboration by identifying all these intersections uh, of the experience of, of our people at Auto Trader is we, for the first time, we ha- held a network summit that was for two days and all the networks came together. Uh, and they talked about on the first day how the year um, that we've just been through has gone and, and uh, the challenges that they face as networks. And then on the second day, together with all of our senior leadership team, everyone of our senior leadership team, they concentrated on the commitments that they have for the next 12 months. And they tried to identify loads of opportunities for collaboration. So uh, as part of deciding that, uh, they looked at uh, all the feedback that we get from all the different surveys that we do, but also feedback that they have from all the different focus groups that they run. And they try to identify what the problem is and identify solutions. And when identifying solutions, they look at how can they collaborate in order to put solutions in place. Because no problem is as simple that you know one of the networks can address. So that has created a lot of opportunities there to work together and address people in a way that uh, accepts uh, and uh, um, uh, understands uh, the intersections uh, that uh, everyone experiences. So that's something new that we're trying, being very deliberate uh, this year uh, about doing something that acknowledges that. And yeah, that's amazing. And I, I really like what you said there about it's about bringing your whole selves as well. So the fact that we all have intersections to our identity and getting people to recognize that um, and creating, I guess, a part of that inclusive culture is creating a space for people to be their entire selves at work and removing those barriers. And it sounds like you've kind of looked at how you can make sure that those networks are speaking to each other and connecting with each other and finding that common ground. Um, So Jax, can I get you to talk a little bit about that? I know you're really passionate about intersectionality and talked a lot about those intersectional identities. Um, Would you be able to kind of elaborate on that for me? Yeah, um, I think, one thing where we started with intersectionality was about sharing lived uh, lived experience and stories from our staff. Um, and we've still got a long way to go with that because it's about building confidence for people to share what they're confident in sharing with, with their workplace. Um, so, for, for example, for myself, I've been a human book now for the past uh, several years for, for an EDI organisation uh, sharing my story of intersectionality. Uh, And I think that's a really good place to start for people to understand intersection and how it works for individuals. And because I shared my story, other staff, especially the chairs of the staff networks, have stepped up to share their lived experience as well in a workplace and some of their backgrounds. So I I was born and raised in Manchester. My, My mother is white British and my father is biracial. My grandparents are from Ireland and Nigeria. And I identify as a cisgender lesbian woman of colour. So intersectionality is the concept that all oppression is linked. Um, And it's it's a metaphor for understanding the ways multiple forms of inequality or disadvantage sometimes compound themselves and create obstacles that are not clearly understood uh, within conventional ways of thinking. One thing we've done quite recently to really connect um, with the workforce to have empathy to identify with intersectionality is launch our reverse mentoring program. And this has been really successful. Uh, We've just completed a six month trial with 10 senior leads and 10 staff members from our networks who were confident in sharing lived experience in the workplace and sharing some of their story around intersectional oppression um, in the workplace and beyond. And we're just evaluating that program at the moment. And I think it's really, really important um, that we listen to the learning from that reverse mentoring program, which we've done. We've had some really good reviews from the people taking place. And especially from people 
people that can influence change across the organisation, showing more empathy and understanding intersectionality. But from a staff network perspective, for example, for Black History Month, um, we, we've rolled out a calendar um, to do with Black identities throughout the year. So we're trying to move away from that tokenistic one month a year to look at Black history and Black identity to make it more intersectional across the networks. And um, so at the moment, another example is for Lesbian Visibility Day on the 26th of April, we've got the Women's Staff Network working with the Rainbow Network to actually pull together an event to share lived, um, lived experience and stories, but also to put an article on our intranet page um, so that all, the whole organisation can take part in that event. So, but it's not just about that lesbian identity, it's about lesbian women of colour, it's about lesbians with disabilities, uh, with mental health issues, it's about violence against women, it's about a um, whole range of issues uh, to do with lesbian identity um, and also looking at um, trans and non-binary identity now we're still on a journey with that. And I think every time we've got an opportunity to do a nudge, a lunch and learn, a workshop across the organisation to bring it alive. And um, because like Christos said, you know, a lot of intersectionality is based on theory. It's for us to actually bring that alive so that it's meaningful. One can experience homophobia and racism at the same time. Others might experience gender or class discrimination. However, being white will always protect and insulate um, you're from racism, for example, if you identify as white. So for me, it's about having that range of identities, but bringing it alive with lived experience and stories. And if we've got um, a lack of that internally, then we've also got external role models that come and share their stories with us. Um, and, and we've got some great external role models that are very confident, they're trainers already, or have got that experience um, that they're willing to share with the organisation to hopefully increase that voice and that confidence within the organisation for people to step up and use that platform. So having a platform, having that opportunity to have these rich discussions is really, really important. That's great. So I'm actually surprised we're running out of time already. It's been lovely chatting to you both about this. So in terms of just wrapping up, I'd love to hear a little bit about um, your experiences with Manchester Prize All Equals Charter. Um, I know you've both been on this journey with us in developing it over the last few years. So I'd love to just kind of hear why you kind of wanted to be a part of it and what benefits that's had to your organisation. We've got a few minutes left. So um, if I go to you first, Christos. Yeah, so I, I think it's yeah, it's been great to actually be involved from the beginning like in shaping the charter with uh, lots of um, local employers uh, and trying to really have a view and making it different uh, to what else is out there. Uh, I think for for us uh, as other trader, it has uh, allowed us to have a, a lot more uh, conversations that are really good quality conversations as part of taking part in the charter. And I think the consultant that uh, we were very fortunate to, to actually engage with uh, during that process uh, approached those conversations with uh, a lot of uh, respect, but at the same time, she did challenge us a lot uh, when it comes to what we were doing. Uh, and because of their knowledge, uh, we were able to have that opportunity to have someone external to look at what we're doing and really challenge us in a meaningful way, uh, as opposed to taking that approach of that sometimes with charters was very tick boxy. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like that. It actually was very meaningful. It wasn't about scoring uh, and points. It was really about getting that opportunity, sitting down with someone that has a lot of experience that can see what's happening in all these different businesses that they work with uh, and be able to provide you with, with that challenge and feedback so that you can do better. Uh, I think that's, that's the benefit for us. Amazing. Thank you, Christos. And yourself, Jack? I think for me, taking part in the All Equals Charter was an easy choice to make for Greater Manchester's Fine Rescue Service um, and Mancunian um, through and through. And to have something Manchester-centric was so important. So it's fabulous having national um, assessments, but having something localised for Greater Manchester 
is a real opportunity to see our successes and ambitions through a local lens to encourage and increase collaborative EDI work and making real connection with organisations to support, guide and celebrate together was so important. So the All Equals Charter, again, it isn't based on competition or tick box, but on giving support and clear direction uh, for future EDI action plans. So it's really guided us, but also affirmed our progression so we can celebrate where we're up to. I think it's really important to celebrate those small wins um, and get that affirmation that you're on the right track. Um, and it's keeping the vision reachable for us as well and keeping it realistic so that we constantly keep that engagement across our service. And Manchester Pride team makes every effort to guide and support the application and submission process. So giving feedback, which is really transferable to our plans and the assessment outcomes give a real focus on achievement and good practice, like I've said, which is transparent. Um, it looks at your strengths and it looks at development um, for progression moving forward. And the team also gave us really good suggestions for actions as well. So real examples of how to make improvements, which really guides and develops our uh, proposals for senior leads and for the organisation to buy into. Um, so we've always been really excited uh, to be part of um, the All Equals Charter family and long may it continue. Oh, it's so lovely to kind of hear those experiences from the both of you. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure to have this conversation and I hope it's been really helpful to those of you watching from home. Um, but yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much and uh, thank you to both of you for joining me as well.